everybody. Hi. So uh, I'm going to talk today about information security and how it works and where it comes from and where it's going. Uh, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to take a really long view on information security. So does anyone here uh, know what I mean when I say alchemy? Does anyone know what alchemy was? All right. So for those of you who don't know what alchemy was, before we had science, we had a thing that looked a lot like science called alchemy. An alchemist tried to turn lead into gold, right? And they did what scientists do to turn lead into gold. They made up, um, uh, they, they observed things in the world, they saw things happening, and they said, maybe this is causing that. How can I check to see if it's causing that? So they designed an experiment, right? And then they would run the experiment to see whether X was causing Y, and whether they could learn more about the world that would help them in this project to turn lead into gold. But alchemists were different from scientists in one important way. They kept everything that they learned a secret. And human beings have this like common frailty, right? We all have this one thing in common, which is that we're really good at kidding ourselves. Have you ever gotten into an, an argument with someone like maybe your folks uh, or maybe a good friend where you're sure that you're right, you're 100% sure that you're right, and then uh, afterwards you turn around and you see something written down or a picture or you look at your email and you realize you were totally wrong, that your brain had been lying to you about what you remembered, what you thought had happened, right? Human beings are really, really terrible at knowing what's going on in the world. We're really good at kidding ourselves. And what that meant was that alchemists could kid themselves about whether or not their experiments turned out the way that they thought they would. So alchemists would say, I think this causes that, and then they would run the experiment, they look at the results and they go, I was probably right, I was, I'm a smart guy, I was probably right. And they would ignore the parts that didn't fit their, their hypothesis and they'd really make a big deal out of the parts that, that proved them right. So alchemy didn't go anywhere. In fact, we have a, a name for the 500 year period during which we had alchemy instead of science. Does anyone know what that period was called? What? Posey? No. What? The Dark Ages, exactly, right? So alchemists never figured out how to turn lead into gold, but they figured out how to turn dumb superstition and human frailty into something even more valuable than gold. What alchemists started to do after 500 years of getting it wrong is they started to publish their results. They started to tell other people what they thought they'd learned. And what that did was it exposed them to something called adversarial peer review. Adversarial means people who don't like you, Peer is people who work in the same stuff as you, and review means that they pay attention to the stuff that you've done and tell you what they think of it. Yes, Posey? Nothing. Right. So adversarial peer review uh, means that your friends point out the mistakes that you've made, and your enemies tell you what an idiot you were to have made them. And with adversarial peer review, alchemy became something else. Anyone know what alchemy became once they started publishing? Science. And do you know what we, we call that moment? The Enlightenment, right. So we got the Enlightenment, right? That's how we got, um, uh, that's how we got science as we know it today. We uh, let other people see what we thought we knew. Uh, we let them tell us what an idiot we were to have made the dumb mistakes that we made. We corrected those mistakes and we found brick after brick that we could use to build up the entire edifice of science and everything that we know about the world today. All right, so in cryptography, which is kind of the cornerstone of contemporary uh, security, in cryptography we talk about there being three people who are locked in this eternal tr triangle of love and rivalry. Uh, Alice, Bob, and Carol. There are like love songs about Alice, Bob, and Carol on YouTube that you can look up. And the way that it works is Alice and Bob are friends with each other, and they want to share information with each other. And Carol is evil. And Carol wants to know what Alice and Bob are saying to each other. And they want to know, uh, and, and maybe she wants to change what they're saying to each other so that she can trick them. And so Alice and Bob use codes. They use cryptography. And you've got workshops here about cryptography. And there's lots of smarter cryptographers than me at this conference who can tell you all about crypto. They use crypto, they use codes to share messages with one another. And when they use this crypto, they make two really important assumptions. The first one is that they assume that Carol can get a copy of the message after they've scrambled it. And they make that assumption because uh, these days we send our messages through
through media that anyone can see, right? Like, so maybe you send it over a radio wave, like with Wi-Fi. So anyone who's in range of the Wi-Fi, they can get all of the packets, they can see all of the messages, and they can, they can look at what Carol and uh, Alice and Bob are sending to each other. Um, or maybe they use satellite communications, right? Satellite-based internet. So a satellite sits up there in geosynchronous orbit, and it beams down this cone of radio energy that blankets a whole continent. So if Carol is like anywhere on the continent that Alice is on, she can see the message that, that Bob sent to Alice. Or maybe they just send it over the internet, right? So maybe they hop on the internet here, and they pull out their phone, and they, they send a message, and it goes over the Wi-Fi, and then there's like the person at the hotel who runs the Wi-Fi network. That person could be Carol or working with Carol. Or then it jumps onto the backbone of the internet service provider and goes up to them. Maybe it's someone working at the internet service provider. Or it goes to, to um, uh, Bob's uh, internet service provider. Maybe someone between there is working for Carol. So there are a lot of people who could be Carol who could get a copy of the message. So Alice and Bob need to assume that Carol can get the message. If their system only works when Carol can't get a copy of the message, it won't work most of the time. It'll only work when they're actually like, they can hand each other messages, in which case they could just whisper. They don't need codes, right? So that's the first thing that they assume. The second thing that they assume is that Carol knows how they scrambled the message. Carol knows what they did to keep the message a secret, what code they used. So this is a bit weird, right? Why would they assume that Carol knows what code they used? Why wouldn't they try to keep their code a secret from Carol? Well, because we only have one way to find out whether or not a code is any good. Adversarial peer review, right? You have to let strangers who don't like you see what you've done to make your message secret in order to find out whether or not you made mistakes. Because otherwise, if uh, only people who are your friends get to see it, or if only you get to see it, you will miss dumb mistakes that you've made because you're all on the same side and no one has an interest in pointing out your mistakes. Because if it's only people who work in the same company as you who get to see the way that you've made the code, or only people in the same university department as you, or only people who like are your family who get to see the way that you've made up this code, all of those people want you to succeed. And so their brains will lie to them about whether or not there are mistakes in it. Their brains won't find the flaws that their enemies will find. And so they assume that Carol knows what they've done to scramble the code. But there's one thing that Carol does not know, and this is why Alice and Bob are able to communicate in perfect secrecy. Carol doesn't know. Anyone know what's, what you have in crypto? You have the message, you have the cipher, and you have the, the keys, right. So the keys are a thing that you combine with the code to scramble and descramble the message. And so long as you don't have the keys, if the code works, you can never descramble the message. And when I say never, I mean never, right? Your pocket distraction rectangle can scramble a message so thoroughly that if we took every hydrogen atom in the entire universe and turned it into a computer and set every one of those computers doing nothing but trying to guess keys between now and the moment billions of years in the future when the universe runs out of energy and cools down and no more work can be done, you would run out of universe before you ran out of keys. So, so long as Alice and Bob keep their key a secret, Carol can never read the message, even though she knows how they scrambled it and even though she, they, know, um, she, they, they know what the message is. So this is an amazing thing. This is actually a new thing on the face of the earth. We have never had the power to keep messages, this, this, uh, secrets this well. So long as you trust the person on the other side, so long as that person doesn't have someone break into their house and stick a hidden webcam over their computer screen so they can read the message when they decrypt it, you and that person can communicate in perfect secrecy. And we even have all kinds of cool ways of sharing those keys over the internet without letting third parties see them. Um, if you want to Google that, Google dual key cryptography, and you can see how we share keys. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. I'm not, not going to get into it today, because that could take the rest of the talk. But it's clever, and it's cool. All right, so that's how, that's how security works today. But where is it going? Well, it's not going uh, well, I have to say. Um, and it's not going well because of something really weird, a dumb mistake that politicians made in 1996. So in 1996, 
the internet was just kicking off. People were starting to get interested in using the internet to talk to people for reasons other than technical reasons. You know, the early internet was all scientists talking to each other and military contractors talking to each other. They were now starting to talk to each other about other stuff, about what movies they liked and whether they were going to go to, out for hamburgers on Friday. And um, the people who made music and the people who made movies and the people who made video games and books, they started to worry that this internet will become a way to share stuff without paying for it. And they also started to get very hopeful that maybe they could use cryptography to, instead of charging people once for accessing their works, right, instead of selling you a book or selling you a movie, that maybe they could just sell you like one fragment of the movie, right? The right to watch the movie once, the right to read the book, but only when you're in Las Vegas and not when you're somewhere else. So maybe they could sell you a tour guide to New York that you, could, that you had to pay for if you were in New York but was free to use somewhere else. So you could, you could pick it up at home in Minnesota and you could read it and go, this will be really useful when I get to New York, but when you got to New York, you'd have to pay to use it. And they saw a gold mine and they thought, what we're going to need to do is figure out how to use cryptography so that we can lock people out of the computers that they own and that they use every day. Right? That was their plan. So they came up with this new crypto model where instead of having Alice and Bob and Carol, you just have Alice and Bob. So think of Netflix. Bob could be Netflix. Uh, Bob wants to send you a movie and he wants to make sure that you can watch that movie, but he wants to make sure that you can't save that movie and watch it again later. So you can't just download all your favorite Netflix movies, cancel your Netflix subscription and come back to it and, and then just watch those movies for as long as you want. Bob has weird ideas about how people watch movies. He thinks people only have like 11, 11 movies or 100 movies that they like and once they've got those they don't need to subscribe anymore. But Bob, the Bobs of the world sometimes have weird ideas. So Bob wants to make sure that, you can, that, that he can send you the movie but that you can only watch the movie on the terms that he, uh, that he set. And so Bob gives you a piece of software for decrypting the movie. He, he scrambles the movie, so no one in the world can descramble the movie unless they have the keys. And then he gives you a piece of software that has the keys, but that piece of software doesn't have a save button. And so you can't save the movie. Right? So it's not Bob and Alice and Carol, it's just Bob and Alice. Bob sends Alice the message, Bob gives Alice the keys, Bob hopes that Alice never figures out where he hid those keys. Right? This doesn't work. It doesn't work because Alice can be anyone in the world. Alice can be anyone who goes out and buys a Netflix subscription. That person can, can then um, uh, look very hard at the Netflix client, at the Netflix software, and figure out just where Bob hid the keys. And this is why every time we make one of these digital lock systems, it's usually broken in like a day, often by a teenager with nothing better to do. Right? Because, not because the people who make it are dumb, but because the idea of hiding keys in something that you give to your enemy is dumb. And um, it, you, know, you can think about it like if you were a bank manager and you had a really cracking good safe, no matter how good that safe was, you wouldn't leave it in the bank robber's living room. Right? Because you understand that the bank robber, once the safe is in her living room, she can subject it to torments that every safe will eventually yield to, right? So in the case of Netflix and Bob and Alice, Alice might be like a bored grad student who's got a bunch of undergraduates who are clever but get into trouble when they're left on their own, and she wants to give them a task, and no one's in the lab with the electron tunneling microscope this weekend. And so Alice has access to a lot of pretty badass equipment that she can use to figure out where Bob hid the keys. So in 1996, a United Nations specialized agency called the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO. It's, it all becomes acronym soup from here in. But you can remember WIPO because they're where all the world's dumbest copyright laws come from. They're like, they have the same relationship to dumb copyright that Mordor has to evil in Middle Earth. Right? It all comes from the crack of doom in Geneva. Right? So uh, WIPO came up with this treaty, the WIPO Copyright Treaty, the WCT. And what that treaty said was that the countries that signed it would have to pass a law that made it illegal, really illegal, to extract keys from programs that had keys hidden in them, or to tell people how to extract keys from those programs, or to tell them uh, information that they could use to figure out how to get the keys. 
And in 1998, America passed a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA. Uh, and you may know the DMCA because that's what, uh, who wrote all of your, uh, made all your favorite videos on YouTube. You know, whenever you want to see a good video on YouTube, it says this video removed because of a claim under the DMCA. That DMCA, right? So the DMCA has this section, section 1201, and section 1201 says that if you help people find keys in programs that control access to copyrighted works, that for a first offense, you can go to jail for five years and you can pay a $500,000 fine. It hasn't happened very often that they put programmers in jail. Just one a guy named Dmitry Skilyarov, who showed that Adobe's ebook, uh, Digital Locks, uh, didn't work. Uh, they put him in jail. He actually presented that at this conference, uh, 2002. Stood up on a stage down at the Rio Hotel, which is where the conference used to be, uh, gave a presentation about ebooks. And then the FBI let him away in handcuffs for showing people how to read books the wrong way. So um, uh, that sent a pretty clear message to a lot of programmers. And those programmers stopped looking, or when they looked, they stopped talking about what they found in things that had digital locks on them. Because nobody wants to go to jail for five years for helping people watch movies the wrong way. So they operated in secret if they operated at all. You may have seen a program. Anyone know a program called Handbrake? Anyone ever use Handbrake? Handbrake rips DVDs for you. And the programmers who made that are anonymous, and they hide out. They don't tell anyone who they are, because nobody wants to go to jail for helping people rip their DVDs. So um, that was bad. And it, it let companies engineer all kinds of crazy ripoffs uh, over the years that followed. Right. So. Um, if you have a computer that has a CD and DVD drive, and you put a CD in it, that CD uh, uh, will wake up software that the manufacturer supplied with your computer that will say, would you like to convert the music on the CD so you can take it with you on your distraction rectangle, or stream it to something else, or use it as background music in your, in your uh, uh, school projects, or make it into a ringtone or an alarm tone? All that stuff just happens, right? There's no digital lock on the CD. And so programmers could write that software that lets you do all that legal stuff with the music on your CD, more value that came out of your CD. If you take a DVD and you stick it in your, DVD drive, in your CD DVD drive, all your computer will let you do with it is the same thing you could do with it in 1996 when DVDs hit the market, which is watch it. And since 1996, not one new feature has been added to the DVD. If you want to watch a DVD on your phone, you can't do what you do with your music. Stick the disc in, have the music automatically go to your phone. If you want to watch a DVD on your phone, you have to buy the DVD again as a movie through the iTunes store or through the uh, Amazon store or through the Google store. So this engineered all kinds of crazy ripoffs. wasn't good. Um, and that was bad enough as it, as it kind of cooked along. But a funny thing happened on the way to the future, which is that the world became a world made out of computers. So these days, a car, the most important fact about that car is not the transmission, it's not the engine, it's not the ignition system, it's the computer in the car. So uh, one of the presenters at this year's DEF CON uh, showed that uh, they could um, uh, take a Jeep Cherokee and over the internet seize control of the Jeep Cherokee's computers and take over the steering and the brakes. The most important fact about that Jeep is not the tires, it's the computer. That Jeep is a computer that you put your body inside of that then drives at 100 miles an hour down the highway with you trapped inside of it. And depending on whether or not you can trust that computer, you're either going to get to where you're going or something terrible is going to happen to you. This building is a computer that we put our bodies inside of. Because modern buildings are built with such a high specification of insulation, because that's the only way you can run air conditioning uh, in a cost-effective way and you know, hot as blazes La uh, uh, Las Vegas, um, that if the uh, computers are shut down that control the climate control in this building, if those computers are shut down, this building would become un uninhabitable almost immediately. And because of the way that buildings like this trap humidity, if you left the computers off for any length of time, the building would start filling up with black mold. And before long, the only thing you could do with it to render it habitable again is knock it down to the foundation slab and build a new one. This building is a computer that you live inside of. But it's not just that we keep our bodies inside of computers these days. I travel all the time. And the first rule of the heavy traveler is always be charging, ABC. So wherever I go, like many of you, the first thing I do when I get into a room is I scan the baseboards for plugs. Because I'm always looking for somewhere to plug my laptop in. 
And one day, I was sitting in an airport lounge and feeling super smug because I'd gotten the only working plug in this airport lounge. And I was charging up before a long flight. I used to live in Europe, so I had all these long flights. And uh, a guy walked up to me, and it, like, you know, a guy in a suit, and I'm like a guy dressed like I am. And he said, uh, I, in what I thought was a very cheeky way, uh, do you mind if I use that plug? So, you know, I looked at him over my glasses, and I said, I'm charging my laptop before the flight. And he said, oh. And he rolled up his pants leg, and his leg was off at the knee. And below the knee, he had a robotic prosthesis on. And he said, I need to charge my leg before the flight. <laughs> and I said, the plug is all yours. Right? So we increasingly have computers integrated into our bodies. Uh, a researcher who died two years ago named Barnaby Jack gave a demo in Australia of his ability to remotely take control of implanted defibrillators. These are computers connected to batteries that live inside of your chest cavity and are connected directly to your heart. And they're for people whose hearts stop beating because of their heart conditions. And it would shock you back into life, right? You've seen this on the movies. When someone has a heart attack, they rub the paddles together and bam, shock them back to life. This does it automatically. It sits in your chest. And doctors, well, they want to get telemetry off of it. They want to know what it's doing, what it's detecting about your heart. And they want to be able to reprogram it if they have new features or if they find bugs in it. And so these doctors, um, uh, they use a wireless interface to connect to it because it's hard to connect a USB cable to something inside your chest cavity, right? You need a scalpel. And uh, Barnaby Jack showed that over the wireless interface, he could administer lethal shocks to people with implanted defibrillators. In fact, he showed one better. He showed that he could install a wireless virus on people's implanted defibrillators. And they would scan constantly for other implanted defibrillators. And when they found them, like if you went to the hospital to have your defibrillator service, and you were in the ward where all the other people with the defibrillator were, it would reprogram all of their defibrillators to seek out other defibrillators and reprogram them. And then at some time in the future, kill every one of them in their shoes where they stood dead as doornails. Right? Now there's a thing about a world made out of computers combined with a world where the government says, if you put a lock on something, we will use taxpayers' money to stop people from breaking that lock. And what that is, is an attractive nuisance, a moral hazard, an invitation to mischief. Because if you tell a company that if you um, make a device that has an add-on, like a printer with a printer cartridge, or an iPhone with a charger cable, or a Nest digital thermostat that can run apps, and you put just the thinnest, dumbest, easy to break digital lock, that we will sue on your behalf, we will prosecute any of your competitors who removes that lock to give your customers more value. So that you can always charge as much as you want for spare tires, or inkjet ink, or apps. Um, then companies start doing it. And every one of these categories now has digital locks on them. And so every one of these categories is now something where programmers who discover vulnerabilities, who discover mistakes the programmers have made, no longer can report that. And that brings us back to alchemy. Because if you're not allowed to talk about what you've done, what you found, if there's no adversarial peer review, then bugs will lurk in our devices. Now, every three years, the US Copyright Office holds hearings of whether they should grant exceptions to this 1201 law, the DMCA 1201, in which they ask, are there any ways in which this is interfering with things that would be in the public good? And this year, they held these hearings. And they heard some stuff that will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So one of the researchers who filed a, a comment, he has diabetes, type 1 diabetes. And um, if you have diabetes, you need to take insulin to balance out your blood sugar. And the way that we did this before we had small, cheap computers is a human being, usually the person with diabetes, would take some blood, and they would measure what their blood sugar was, and then they would go to a chart, and they'd calculate how much insulin they needed, and they'd draw that much into a needle, and they'd stick themselves with a needle. And um, that's being a lab tech, and human beings are really crappy lab techs. Computers are awesome lab techs. And so what would happen is over the years, you'd make little mistakes. One little mistake, another little mistake. You'd be too busy. You'd let it go. And over the years, you'd shorten your life, take five, 10 years off your life. Now, this researcher who filed in, in the 1201 hearing, he said, I want an implanted defibrillator, but I don't have one because I audited the code on those implanted defibrillators. And you'd be crazy 
to stick one of those computers inside of your body. But I can't tell you why, because they use digital locks to make sure that doctors have to buy their software uh, to get analytics off of those implanted uh, uh, insulin pumps. Um, and uh, in order to protect that profit margin, they've put a lock on it. And if I remove the lock or tell you about the mistakes they've made that you could use to remove the lock, then I commit a felony. And so all around America, there's diabetics walking around with these wirelessly capable implanted insulin pumps that can kill them in their boots. And it wasn't just implanted medical devices. Um, there was a farmer who filed comments. And he said, I have a John Deere tractor, you know those big green tractors. And uh, one day, my wheel sensor went out. Right? My tractor wouldn't go. And so I called up the John Deere company and I said, my tractor won't go. And they said, yeah, there's a sensor that senses whether your wheels have enough air pressure, your tires have enough air pressure. And uh, it, it says it's faulty. So it's getting a bad reading. We'll ship you a new part. You should have it in two days. And he said, but I want to plow my field now. Can I just turn this off? And they said, no, no, no. We can't give you the, key, the software keys you would need to get access to the software on your tractor. That's a trade secret. So he was petitioning to allow uh, himself to jailbreak his tractor. And um, John Deere doesn't really care if you uh, change the sensor out on your, on your wheel yourself or suppress its output. But John Deere has these things called torque sensors that are on the wheels. And they sense how hard the wheel has to spin as it moves around the farmer's field. They conduct centimeter accurate surveys of the soil density of farmer's fields across America. But they don't tell the farmers how their fields perform. They tell seed companies how their, seeds perform, how their, their, their fields uh, perform. And then if you want to know it, you have to buy seeds from those seed companies. And so they want to make it illegal to jailbreak your tractor. And they filed comments with the Copyright Office and said, no tractor jailbreaking. And then GM, who make cars, they filed a comment in support of, of, uh, of, of uh, John Deere. And they said, you shouldn't be allowed to jailbreak your car either. Why not? Well, because they want to make sure that mechanics can only fix your cars after they sign a contract that says, I'm only going to buy parts from GM. And so the GM can get as much money as possible for the parts that they put in your cars. So these companies, don't, they, they, they're not doing this because they want to make the security in your devices weaker. They're doing it because they want to make more money. But the side effect of making it a felony to tell you about flaws in your devices is that it makes it impossible for you to know uh, whether or not a device is something you can trust. And it short circuits the process that separates alchemy from science. So it's a terrible state of affairs. Now, I work for an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They're one of the sponsors. You can see them on the, some of the banners. And there's a banner around here somewhere that had an EFF logo on it. Um, and EFF were, were, were some of the good guys in the internet. We, we um, help defend people's rights on the internet. And we've launched a 10-year project to end this law and to end all digital locks within a decade. That's our big project. Um, it's, what I'm, it's what I'm doing for the next decade. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about it in detail because there's not much to say yet, except that's why we're doing it. So I hope you found that interesting, and I'm happy to take any questions. Nico, how much time do we have? Are we out of time? Take a couple of questions. So if we could alternate maybe girls and boys. Are there any girls who'd like to ask the first question? Yeah. Doesn't it create a monopoly? It does create a monopoly. That's a great question. Yeah. And aren't monopolies illegal? No, monopolies are not illegal. They're subject to strict scrutiny, which means that the government generally thinks monopolies are a bad idea. And if you can show the monopoly is doing something that's against the public interest, they will, um, they will intervene. But monopolies aren't strictly illegal. And the thing about copyright is it's supposed to be a monopoly. right? I'm supposed to be the only person who can authorize other people to copy my books. In fact, before we had the term intellectual property, we used to use the term author's monopoly to describe the author's uh, relationship to copyright. And so this is this funny thing, where this thing that was uh, mostly harmless, sometimes a bit weird kind of corner of the law has suddenly become the single most important fact of all of our legal systems. Uh, I'm going to stick with kids for now. Uh, and if there are no kids with, with their hands up, I'll call on grown-ups. Yes? Yes? 
Were the farmers told about the sensors in their tractors before they bought them? Another excellent question. I think maybe. I think that there's probably, you know, if you've ever like gone to a website, before you can use it, you have to click this agreement that's like 700 pages long. You never read it because whenever you read it, it says stuff like, by being dumb enough to use this service, you agree that like we're allowed to come over to your house and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and punch your grandmother and eat all the food in your fridge. Um, you know, like, like they, they probably says it somewhere. But you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can't, even if you give people notice. In law, we do have this idea that notice isn't enough for some kinds of, um, some kinds of arrangements, right? Like, so if I put a sign up over the door of my bookstore that said, you're allowed to come into my bookstore, but if I don't like you, I can murder you, it doesn't mean that I get to murder you, right? And so there's some things, some rights that we expect people have that they can't contract out of, and then there's some other rights that people have that they can contract out of, but only if they negotiate the contract. So um, maybe I can negotiate with you uh, the terms on which, you know, like if you were going to get married if, if, to, to my kid, right, maybe the two of you can negotiate your prenuptial agreement that said, like, by getting married, you agree that, like, this is my grandmother's wedding ring and it's not going to go to you if we get a divorce or whatever, right? But what you probably can't do is just have, like, a, a long letter that says, by marrying me, you agree to the following and it's not negotiable, right? that there's a difference in law between terms that can be, that have to be negotiated and terms that don't. Uh, any other kids with questions? Posey. Why? Why is, there that ter why is there that difference? Well, because a lot of the times, um, we assume that people who negotiate, who actually have a chance to talk back, that they um, uh, will think a whole issue through and that maybe they'll get up and walk away from the table but usually those, those contracts where you just have to click through to, to, to agree to them, those contracts are um, usually just sort of crammed down people's throat where they don't have a lot of choices. Like you've already bought your plane ticket and you show up at the airport and on the back of your ticket there's just a bunch of junk about the things you can't sue the airline over. It's kind of too late. You want, there's a difference between negotiation among equals and things that are just crammed down people's throats by big businesses. Yeah. Like when do when do we uh, when do we seize the Winter Palace, take the armory, and demand an end to dumb copyright laws? Well, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, there are some real problems with the legislative process in America and in other countries in the world, and they've gotten worse over the last 20 years. The policy outcomes, the legal outcomes from lawmaking processes, have become more and more favorable to a smaller and smaller group of richer and richer people and companies. There's a, a group at Princeton that did a study of 20,000 US legislative and policy outcomes over the last 20 years and found that in every case where there was a conflict between the public interest and the interest of the 10% richest people in America, that it went to the richest people in America. And so that is a genuine problem with the legislative process. And the companies that do this, they make a lot of money from doing it. And that's one of the reasons that these laws have remained intact for as long as they have. It's a real problem. But in America, there's something um, uh, that other countries don't have, which is a strong constitution and an independent judiciary. That means that judges can invalidate laws by asking themselves whether or not the laws are consistent with the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And so normally, if you want to reform the law in, in countries that don't have strong constitutional traditions or in countries that don't have independent judiciaries, you have to convince a majority of lawmakers to vote against that bad law or in favor of a, of a better one. Um, but in the case of America, sometimes you can just get one judge or three judges, or in the case of the Supreme Court, five judges to agree with you, and you can make bad laws go away. So in the early 1990s, it was illegal for civilians to use cryptography. Uh, only the military was allowed to use cryptography. And the NSA banned civilian access to crypto. And we made all kinds of arguments back then about why this was a terrible idea, right? Like they said, oh, well, civilians can use this crypto called DES50. And that'll be strong enough that uh, like bank robbers and the mafia and spies, they won't be able to break it. 
but we can if we need to, to like see what the bad guys are doing, right? Like if a criminal uses it, we'll always be able to gain access to it. And we made arguments about why DES50 was crap. A guy named John Gilmore is one of the founders of EFF. He built a computer from scratch to break DES50. It cost him a quarter million dollars and it could guess all the DES50 keys within two hours. He said the whole American banking system can be defeated in two hours for a quarter million dollars under, this, under the proposal you're making. And nobody in Washington cared. But then we found a programmer named Daniel J. Bernstein at the University of California at Berkeley. And, and Dan was publishing strong crypto on the internet, the source code for it. And we argued that he had the First Amendment free speech right to publish source code. That code was a form of speech protected under the First Amendment. And a uh, Ninth Circuit judge in California agreed. And then the NSA appealed it, and it went to the appellate division in the Ninth Circuit, and a majority of the Ninth Circuit appellate division agreed, and that was the end of the crypto ban. We didn't have to convince one lawmaker that they were wrong. All we needed to do was convince a judge that it was unconstitutional. And that's why I think we can make a change here. So Nico, you look like you've got your shepherd's crook there. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank